Hello. This is a full, full house. Oh, and a quiet one, wonderful. Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight for this first-of-a-kind event at the New York Academy of Medicine, where our mission is to drive progress towards improved health through attaining health equity. My name is Ilana Kiefer, and I am the director of NIAM Center for Healthy Aging. And for the last several months, I have also moonlighted as an opera producer. <laughs> we have a packed agenda tonight. First, we will, we will be welcomed by two key supporters of this program, NIAM President Dr. Ann Kurth and Alfred P. Sloan Foundation President Dr. Adam Falk. Then we will hear two short lectures, one by uh, NIAM Senior Scholar in Residence, Dr. Elaine Larson, about the life and impact of Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis, and then from Dr. Ray Lustig, the composer of tonight's opera, and Matthew Doherty, librettist, of this opera, uh, who will set the scene for tonight's performance. After that, curtains up for a 45-minute version of the opera Semmelweis, developed and produced by the American Opera Project based in Brooklyn. Then, I promise we will feed you with a cocktail reception right outside these doors. This event came about because of one very special NIAM staff member, Miss Carolyn Stem. Carolyn, please stand up and wave. Stand up, Carolyn. Woo! In December 2012, almost to the day, Niam hosted a performance right here in this gorgeous space of scenes from the opera you are about to hear. Over the last decade, two important developments took place to lead us here tonight. Uh, Ray and his team continue to work on the opera, and as we all know so well, the world became obsessed with washing our hands. <laughs> In fact, this week is National Handwashing Awareness Week. <laughs> so, when Carolyn, herself a former professional opera singer, heard about the premiere of this opera in Budapest, page change, hold on. In Budapest, Hungary, uh, she approached me about once again hosting Semmelweis at NIAM. Before I was able to counter that we typically produce healthy aging research and not musical performances, she calmly explained to me that this opera is about the man who discovered hand hygiene, and that aligned well with our research on infection prevention in long-term care facilities, which was funded in 2020 by one of tonight's sponsors, the Soraya Company. And speaking of hand hygiene, the bathrooms are right outside the doors and past the elevators. And, oh, and please silence your cell phones. So here we are. In addition to Carolyn, this event was made possible by our generous funders, two sanitation and health product manufacturers, the Japanese-based Soraya Company and the California-based Best Sanitizers, and of course, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. You will hear from the president of the Sloan Foundation momentarily, and I want to share a few words from the Soraya Company based in Osaka. They say, congratulations on hosting today's event. Soraya would like to express our sincere gratitude to everyone involved in the preparation for this occasion, and we are delighted to have contributed to its organization. This opera presents a unique way to increase awareness of hand hygiene and to create a meaningful impact on promoting health and well-being, something that we are always happy to be a part of. Now back to me. I also want to thank my fabulous team for their practical and emotional support. Grace Morton, Musa Hussein, Clara Schur, Carolyn Stem, Lori Frank, Elaine Larson, Joey Harper, Maggie Guevara, Reggie Richards Peel, Matt Ivis, and his team. Thank you also to Lenny Fishman and his team at Big Apple Event AV for helping us see and hear tonight's event. And of course, I want to give a huge thank you to everyone at the American Opera Project, and especially to my new friends and colleagues, Joel Callow and Charles Jardin. I would now like to ask NIAM President Dr. Ann Kurth to join me on the stage, and I don't think it's too much of a spoiler alert to say that Dr. Kurth's background as an epidemiologist and as a certified nurse midwife makes her uniquely qualified to welcome you all tonight. Thank you, Alana. Wow. 
wonderful. I'm just kidding. Yeah. It is really marvelous to be in this full room together and in this beautiful space. Um, actually, Semmelweis was one of the reasons I became a midwife, so um, this, this is a meaningful uh, evening, but really appreciate you all coming on a cold night. Um, this is a, a tremendous collaboration with the American uh, Opera Project and NIAM, and it illustrates, I think, the power of bringing together the arts with the clinical sciences and health, right? You have to have it together. Um, the themes of the Semmelweis story, they really still resonate today, right? where we still need hand washing for infection control, where maternal mortality differentials still occur. It's a ninefold differential between black and white mothers dying in, the, in this city. And where we must always use evidence, find the evidence, use it, implement it, to move health for everyone forward. So thank you so much to the Alpha P. Sloan Foundation and specifically to Doran Weber and Adam Falk for being a key sponsor for tonight's event. Um, this is not the Sloan Foundation's actually first sponsorship about Dr. Semmelweis either. They supported a West End production uh, that just wrapped up, uh, fabulously successful, of the play Dr. Semmelweis starring Mark Rylance uh, that just, uh, just uh, uh, wrapped up. So thank you for bringing his story uh, to many audiences in different forms. And please um, welcome. So th thank you. I'm going to step up here because this is very intimidating, this thing here. Um, so it's wonderful to be here. And yes, hand washing is having a moment. Um, Ignaz Semmelweis is having a moment. Uh, and uh, it was quite by coincidence that um, Mark Rylance's play, which we had been working with them for quite a while, came about in the, the very same year as, as this wonderful opera. Um, I wanted to just take a moment and say why in the world the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, which does not make a hygiene product, is, um, is one of the sponsors, sponsors of this. And it's part of our public understanding of science and technology program, which we've had for, for decades. The thesis of that program is that it is not a science communication program narrowly about explaining things to people. I'm a scientist by training. Believe me, I love explaining things to people. But that is actually not the right way to think about bridging the gulf between people's understanding and appreciation of science and maybe where, where we are right now in too much of our culture. The, the issues are much more cultural. And public understanding is a much broader concept than simply grasping scientific facts. The thesis is that what people need is to see science and scientists as, as, as one of them. Scientific activity is a thing that's done by people like them with all of their flaws and all of their aspirations and all of their hopes. And that when they see, encounter science and scientists in, in art forms, in particular in music, in opera, in theater, in film, in television, they can make an identification with the motives of scientists, with the lives of scientists, that then lend a kind of credibility that seems all too often to be lacking to their understanding of what scientists are telling them when they tell them to wash your hands or put on a mask. And that crossing that cultural barrier requires the arts. And so we are deeply invested in the arts in this public understanding program and really seeking really interesting ways to bring science into the arts and bring the arts into science. So with that, it's just, we're thrilled to be part of this project. We're really looking forward to, um, looking really looking forward to the opera. And I just wanna thank everybody who's made this possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now for the lecture portion of the evening, I would like to welcome Dr. Elaine Larson. Um, she is NIAM's Senior Scholar in Residence, um, and she's also the Anna Maxwell Professor Emerita and Special Lecturer at Columbia University School of Nursing and the Mailman School of Public Health. She is a former dean at the Georgetown University School of Nursing and a fellow at the National Academy of Medicine, Society for Healthcare Epidemiologists of America, Association of Professionals in Infection Control and Epidemiology, the American Academy of Nursing, and the Infectious Diseases Society of America. Elaine, please join us. You okay? Yeah. Here we go. So, Adam, I hope that it's more than a moment that hand hygiene is having, okay? And also, 
I just want to say, we should change our thinking and not call it hand washing, because now we also have hand sanitizer, which works just as well and fast. And what Semmelweis did was hand hygiene, not really washing. So the passion and the pain, what I want to do is two things. First of all, again, thank our funders. We are so grateful, and this allowed us to offer to you a reasonable price for coming. And uh, we're, we're very grateful for that. Secondly, I want to give a little a bit of context historically about Semmelweis so that we're all on the same page when we see the opera and we can see, although there's artistic li license and so forth, that the opera really is quite um, consistent with the life of Semmelweis. So a little bit of history. First of all, let me talk about purple uh, fever for a minute. It was the deadly scourge of women for centuries. And uh, actually, it caused about two-thirds of women who died in childbirth, uh, that it was the cause of their death. And in those days, in, for many d centuries, about one in six or seven women died during childbirth, uh, mostly from purple sepsis. Uh, it took its greatest toll uh, among working class women because if you were poor or working class, you had your, your babies in the hospital, but that was the last resort because people in the hospital were more likely to die than people who had their babies at home and only rich people could afford to have their babies at home. So historically, purple sepsis was clearly not understood. They thought maybe it was because of a big cause, they thought, was hysteria, hysteria. Some of the you know consistent things with what Freud said and others said, emotions, poisons from menstrual fluid, imbalance of the four humors of the body, or God's vengeance. It was, it, we now know that it was caused by an, by a, an infectious agent, group A, streptococcus, that now still um, causes a lot of different diseases and is manifested in a number of ways. It causes scarlet fever, it causes strep throat, and it causes rheumatic fever. Enters Ignaz Semmelweis, who was born in Budapest. He was Hungarian in 1818. He was an obstetrician and a scientist. In 1846, he took a position on the faculty at the Vienna Lying In Hospital, which is the hospital where women had their babies if they had to, if they had to go to the hospital. He was one of the early ones who noted a discrepancy in the death rates between women who were attended by the physicians, the obstetricians, and those who were attended by midwives. And you can see in the upper uh, level that in the first clinic, which was run totally by physicians, the death rate was a many times higher than the death rate among the, uh, in the clinic that was run totally by midwives. He tested a number of hypotheses. He said, well, maybe because all of the physicians are men and all of the midwives are women, it's because the men have larger hands. So then he tried allowing only physicians with little hands to, <laughs> to deliver baby. That didn't work. He said, well, maybe it's because the women are staying, it's, maybe it's the women who stay in the areas that stink from the miasmas, from the sewage, et cetera. So he, he only, he had, uh, you know, he looked at that. That didn't work. It didn't matter where they were located in the hospital. He said, well, maybe it's the way they're positioned. So he tried different positions on the side, standing up, lying down, et cetera. That didn't work. And then he had a breakthrough when a colleague of his, during an autopsy, uh, was um, with a, an accidental uh, stick with, a, with an instrument, died of a disease that was identical in terms of its symptoms to pur pur purple sepsis. And he recognized that purple fever was transmitted through the autopsy material. He didn't know what it was, but he realized that. So this led to him realizing that the purple fever could be directly transmitted from one person to another. And the midwives, because they never did autopsies, it was only the physicians, was, that was part of the reason why they had lower death rates. So what he did was, for the first time, 
mandated that physicians, after attending at an autopsy, before they delivered a baby, had to clean their hands and soak their hands in chlorinated lime, which is basically like soaking your hands in, le in bleach. That's why I say it wasn't hand washing. Although he's known as the father of hand washing, he's the father of hand hygiene, okay? And what we do now with hand sanitizer is much more similar to what he did than hand washing is today. Soap and water is fine, but uh, the hand the sanitizers at this moment uh, it are actually faster and better than soap and water. But there, were, there was a huge cry against his findings for several reasons. First were political reasons. And the main one was anti-contagionism, anti which was very prevalent in the public and among the medical disciplines at the time. And that was the belief that God would not allow people to get sick from something that we could not see. And this was before you could see germs. So it was a religious belief and a political belief. The other thing was, and this was highly related, and that is that the medical community refused to think that they could be partly to blame for anybody getting sicker. And they, they were actually proponents of anti-contagionism, as was Florence Nightingale in the time. There were scientific reasons also for uh, a, a lot of feedback, po uh, negative feedback, to Semmelweis's discovery. The germ theory, that is the theory that specific microorganism caused a specific disease, was not really established for decades um, after Semmelweis. And the second reason that was that the general way that you disseminate information by, as a scientist is you publish it, right? And it was the same in those days. And he did not publish anything for 13 years. So it was partly that was the problem. And then there were interpersonal reasons. Apparently Semmelweis was a, a real ass, I'm sorry. <laughs> he was tactless, he was single-minded, he was a fanatic and people really did not like him at all. He was a foreigner also. He was Hungarian, he did not speak German, and the Viennese did not like him at all. And the medical community, except for him, at the Vienna Lying in, in the Hospital were all Viennese. So he was a foreigner, and a difficult foreigner at that. So he had a very tragic end to his life. He lost his medical position. They fire, basically fired him from uh, Vienna. He went back to Budapest. He became increasingly more paranoid. He thought everybody was against him. He was angry. He drank heavily. And he displayed erratic behavior. He kind of went nuts. So what happened was that his family finally had to uh, admit him, have admitted to a medical institute, I mean, a mental health, uh, an insane asylum. Um, and he died there in 1865, still in his 40s. And he, um, he was probably beat to death by the staff because in those days there were no pharmaceutical ways to, to control erratic behavior. He was violent, and they had to try to, uh, you know, control him, and they beat him to death. But we don't really know for sure what the cause of his mental problem was. He almost certainly had tertiary syphilis. The, the romantic story is that he was stressed and heartbroken by the tragedy of not being understood. Or, but, uh, and he could have had Alzheimer's, but he certainly almost certainly had uh, tertiary syphilis, which as you probably know, does cause mental neurologic damage. So, it is a perfect Gris for the Mill for an <laughs> opera. I mean, what is opera but drama, passion, and tragedy, and pain? So, but the story continues. Despite this, despite all the resistance and hostility that he and many other physicians at the time and after him who tried to convince the world that the problem was hands and contaminated hands, Hand hygiene now, but it took till the 20th century 
has become a part of the armamentarium for reducing the risk for transmission of infections, for a number of infections. Um, and for example, you can see on the right-hand side, this is a paper that was published in the American Journal of Nursing in 1932 that says, pray, let us wash our hands. Washing the hands is basic, a basically important act in nursing. And it was the same year, 1932, that NIAM published its first, uh, or convened its first report on maternal mortality. So with that background, thank you so much. Enjoy the show, and you will now hear from the composer. Thank you so much. I am not the composer. Um, but I'm going to tell you who is. Uh, Ray Lustig is a genre flu... Oh, and thank you so much, Elaine. Really, can we give her one more round of applause? That was fabulous. Um, so now I want to welcome to the stage uh, two very important people to this opera. Uh, first is going to be Ray Lustig. He is a genre fluid composer hyphen performer creating for concert and opera theater stages, live internet performance, film, and more. His music has been presented in everything from New York City clubs and galleries to major concert halls, opera stages, and festivals uh, around the world. Ray has served on the faculty of the Juilliard School, given master classes, and hosts regular artist salons in his northern Manhattan studio. He is currently at work recording an album version of the music of Semmelweis, and stay tuned for a sneak peek EP release soon. And Matthew Doherty, um, who is the, the librettist for the opera tonight, has published poetry and prose in the Atlantic Monthly, the New York Times, uh, Poetry, and Glimmer Train, which is a literary quarterly. He was a Steger Fellow in Poetry at Stanford University and has an MFA in Creative Writing from the University of Alabama. He is currently completing a law degree at Boston College Law School. And with that, I will turn it over to Ray and Matthew. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Not just for that. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, we, um, I'm, I'm Ray Lustig, Matthew Doherty. Um, we uh, are very honored and happy and grateful uh, to be here and grateful to um, uh, compose the American Opera Project's Composers in the Voice program, where we uh, began this project in 2007, actually, with the first inklings of it. That's where we um, first started um, trying to create scenes for a potential show like this, and um, we're very grateful for that, and super grateful to New York Academy of Medicine and to the sponsors of this evening's event. Uh, but we just wanted to just give a little bit of um, uh, sense of the show. For us, um, I think we were, uh, we were always thinking ab about what the experience would be, the internal experience of this uh, person who s was able to see into uh, a black hole that nobody else could see, um, how alone he must have felt, and then uh, also how um, distressed he must have felt when um, the thing that he saw was so, so awful that it was really unbearable. Um, yes, there was a certain amount of arrogance in the medical community and a certain amount of traditionalism, but it was also um, too awful to think that all of your hard work and all of your life's work had actually been harming your patients rather than helping them. It's a truth that was simply just unbearable. And what's it like to have that awful truth and be alone with that? Um, our work tries to imagine Ignaz Semmelweis sort of at the end of his life um, in the in the desperate state in which he in in which he died, and um, uh, it, I we we try to imagine him sort of thinking back on his life, um, piecing, trying to piece together some type of meaning of, of everything that had come from him. So it's not a typically narrative um, uh, type of work. So you it's it's you know quite abstract. Um, it's sort of told along the lines more of his emotions and um, his um, dreams and the symbols that would be flowing through his mind in, in, um, in this kind of late stage of his life where his, where his brain wasn't really with him anymore. Um, sorry, I've said enough. I'm gonna hand it over to Matthew Doherty, who's, who's the word guy. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
Yeah, I hope you like it. Um, <clears throat> see, I got the best words. Um, but I mean, I would just say for me, as in writing it, it was uh, it it kind of started to make sense to me as a writer when I realized like he wasn't a historical figure at the time. He was just kind of like us, like stuck in the middle, trying to figure out something and there's this kind of, there's this tension between like the brilliance of humanity and the stupidity of humanity and he was right in the middle of it and we're still in the middle of it. <laughs> it I mean, there are things we're trying to figure out today that we will look back at later and, you know, we'll try to figure out why didn't, why did it take us so long? Um, but he did figure it out, but uh, it wasn't really a happy story, but that's kind of how it goes. And I think that's what made it a more interesting story, it made him a, a character that matters to us and that I think we can all, unfortunately, uh, relate to. Thank you. Enjoy.
antiquity. I come down off the streets where the lamps are lit and sweepers sweep. This day for you could be a thousand years. Your ruined city waits for the careful turning of a spade. Wipe the ash from your skin and down into the ground. Give this mystery to me, archaeology. I dig down and down, down and down. And in a ruined tomb, I find my own, my own.
it can clearly be seen that there are ha <coughs> half the number of sick in the neighboring midwives ward as there are in our academic clinic. Still, everything is questionable, no doubt. The great number of victims is the undeniable reality. Only God knows the number of victims who have fallen into their graves before their time. As it turns out, if decomposing organic material is introduced into a living organism, it can initiate decomposition. The specific cause of death 
is that poison cells enter the vascular system. So it is not the wound that causes the death, but the poison. could hang myself upon this wall it wouldn't be so strange to see me thus arranged alongside the most brilliant things of all I lived there for an hour all alone when they want you they will bring your body home In a stranger's voice I heard Spoken in no tongue I know These murmurs from across the sea That still somehow were made by me In clear but broken semblances Intact as separate languages My mind a coach on two roads at once Riding over cobblestone and mountain Both that turn together into nonsense And this truth that now I see Will be visible to all but now ever have a best idea and did it ever seem so clear that all of the engineers of the knowledge that we hold so dear were only selling souvenirs only peddling souvenirs I can see the fallen world anew and see the lines the masons drew as all askew. And I can see a world that's true, a world so absurd that makes my mind unnerved. Our learned truths are artifice, and I am somehow an artist who must make the mundane startle us, must make the mundane startle us. I took my book out in the rain I had to see where I went wrong Or should I just play right along And found the page where I had sketched the veins of streets And pages full of women's names Death figures copied from the wall it looks so strange I watched the rain become the streets I was going home I was going home and we are not the saviors we who rummage through the bodies looking for the truth the ones who spread dangerous stories will find an enemy in me. You have a part in this massacre. Teachers, lords, the killing must stop. And to stop it, I will be on guard. 
And those who dare to teach dangerous doctrines about corporal fever will find a powerful enemy in me. There was no other way to put an end to the murder than to ruthlessly expose my opponents. In this massacre, you have a part, Professor. I'll be on guard. The truth must be brought to the attention of stakeholders. The murders must end. Corporal's fever and Kolechka's illness are the same. Who dares uphold dangerous doctrines? I must go to the phone. I'm going to find a powerful opponent. I, I will find a strong opponent in me.
in the past where the bodies go the finding of San Marco moved me so in a notebook page ruined and dry I still can hear that rainstorm and came home to find My best idea Where I find you light My ruined mind Why did you bring me here? Dark figures changing on the wall I can't recall I can't recall Listen, listen close to what I say. Only now to prove me mad and keep me locked away. Am I to you a dangerous one? And has the revolution come? How was I? happens to a body that resists, a body that resists, that is your empire of the genius men of murderers. Now I hear and listen, listen close to what I say. It's my blood, you washed your once again today and if you are alive because of me am I not your father the lives that I set free come back to talk to me come down from your cross you were nothing at all were my best idea here and here and here where I found you lights my ruined mind you started me you started me and just some words could make it so I see. 
said, free, come back to talk to me. Grace, I was going home. I was going home. I need an experiment. You started me, you started me. Now think.
Thank you so much to the American Opera Project for that spectacular performance. One more round of applause, please. <laughs> Woo! Um, and thank all of you for joining us tonight. We hope you'll join us for some refreshments. There are hand sanitizer machines outside as well. And thank you all. Have a lovely night.